what we come for, isn't it? Get that dose of Jesus on our mind to inner charge, inner, inner charge, energize and charge our weeks up and get us ready to rock and roll for, for Jesus the rest of the week. Hey, listen, I am so excited about the message today. I, it's funny. I, I, I was a little bit grieved last week because I was finishing up the straight out of the corner series that I enjoy preaching so much. It was phenomenal. If you missed it, I would encourage you to go to the app. You can go to our app. We have an app. You can download it on your smartphone. Or you can, if you don't have a smartphone, you can just watch it on YouTube through a computer some way. Have the Big House Inc. channel on YouTube. But I'm not going to review it. I've been reviewing it. As I got my review notes for straight out of the corner, I'm like, you know what? I ain't going there. We're going straight to fresh new revelation. And it's just some good stuff. Um, the title of today's message. I've got to give credit to somebody else, though. Um, my first pastor, which is really cool because I'm still very close with him, although there's a lot of distance between us. How many know because of text messaging, internet, Facebook, you can be close to people that you normally wouldn't be able to have been close to? Back in the day when the phone was on the wall, man, that was all you could do. If you missed the call, you missed the call, right? But now people text message, private message, you got all these different venues. And so my pastor, a lot of Sunday mornings, right before I leave my house, he's got my timing down. I don't, don't know how he does it, but I do know how he does it. He's got a real close connection with the Holy Ghost, okay? Um, so my pastor sends me little um, messages on Sunday morning to encourage me still, which is very, very phenomenal. He's retired now, so he no longer preaches in a boat, but he attends a church in Springfield, Missouri. I'm hoping maybe when we do one of those Southwest Missouri big houses, he'd help us get involved in there and put him back. But he sent me this title because he said, this is what you guys do in Phoenix, Arizona. He said, I watch you all the time. I watch what goes on at Big House. I watch the big events. I watch you guys give away turkeys to people. I watch you do block parties. I see postings of serving in the hood every single Saturday. I see you doing events to the, to the, to the motorcycle communities. And, and there's always something going on at Big House. And he said, what I see you doing is you're loving the hell out of your community. Before we pray, I mean, before we dismiss, we pray. Now, I think you can probably pray the hell out of people sometimes, too. How many know that's sometimes important? And, but really more important than anything is that we as a church love the hell out of our community. Yeah. And now, I am telling you, this come, this doesn't come from some, some guy that's trying to be hip, slick, and cool preacher. This comes from old school um, just, and he's just, my, my old pastor, he's just an old school, hellfire and brimstone, Holy Ghost preacher. And, and he said, what I see you doing in Phoenix is, you guys are just, and he, he knows we're in Tempe, but how many understand when I say Phoenix, we're in the Phoenix Valley. Everybody, is everybody track with me when I say that? Like I know some of you live further East Valley, you live in Chandler and Mesa. Some of you live up in North Phoenix, some of you maybe over in Scottsdale, some of you Maryvale, some of you Glendale. Like, we're all over the place. Some of you may actually live in Tempe right here where the church is. But we're all in the valley that's called Phoenix. And that's what, you know, we're recognized as. He said, what I see you guys doing in Phoenix is you're just loving the hell out of your community. And folks, truth of the matter is, that is our job. We're, we're not here to point fingers to condemn. We're not here to shove the gospel down anybody's throat. But your lifestyle is what makes a difference in people. You know what I'm saying? It's your lifestyle. Really and truth. I, I got to be real honest with you. And, and as a preacher, it, 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 you know, it, this, is, this is a humbling thought. Me standing up behind this pulpit has very little to do with your friends coming to Jesus. Does that make sense? Because first off, you've got to love them enough that they would even decide that they would want to even think about coming to your church to hear me preach. Because I, I ain't no special thing. I just happen to be the guy that God chose to be up here behind the pulpit. But when we love people right, they're willing 
to listen to us and they see something in us that they want. So with that, I'm going to share some scriptures and we're going to dig right into the message because I don't want to go overboard on my introduction because I got good stuff in the message. John chapter 3, 16 through 18. Most of you, matter of fact, John 3, 16 might be one of the most popular scriptures. Even wrestlers, you, have, have, you know, uh, Steve Austin kind of hijacked John 3, 16 and called it Austin 3, 16 and you see t-shirts and stuff like that. I don't know where he thinks. He just, he pulled it off and he sold a million t-shirts. I bet he did a million dollars worth of t-shirts just off the 316 that he tagged on because this is important stuff and this has popularity and this is what changes the world this is what it says for God so loved the world that he loved the hell out of him no that would be my translation that's the PJ translation for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. In other words, they won't die and go to hell because of God's love for them. He loved the hell out of their future. For God did not send, and I want you to check this out, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't send his son into this world to point his finger at us. He didn't send his son into the world with a sledgehammer and a mallet Verse 18, that whoever believes in him will not be condemned. You know, the bottom line is it's all about Jesus. It's not about Pastor Jeff. It's not about Big House Inc. How many understand what I'm saying? It's not about whether your Bible is black, purple, maroon, mauve. Although you will generally see me preaching out of a black Bible. More than likely wearing a black t-shirt. <laughs> Once in a while a white t-shirt, and I do have one Bible that's black and white. But that's all one color, you know that. Black and white is an official at Big House with one color. What color is my shirt? Black and white. Jen, what color is your shirt? Black and white. Yeah, that's all one color. So let me take you to a story talking about God's love. Because I like the expression of God's love. I like to see what it looks like when it's fleshed out. I like to see how Jesus did it. And the cool thing is, is we got four books that show us how he did it. And I'm going to focus because we're coming up on Palm Sunday, which is the day that Jesus rolled into Jerusalem. He didn't roll in on a hog. He didn't roll in in a fancy car. He rolled in on a jackass. That's why you cut your eyes on me, girl. This is one of those days I feel like I'm in rare form, okay, folks? He rolled in on a donkey. That's what he rolled in on. <laughs> but before we get there, I want to talk about some miracles. Because Jesus used miracles a lot of times to love the hell out of people. And it wasn't always the person that was getting the miracle that got the hell loved out of them by the miracle. So here we go. Luke chapter 14. That my, my title of scripture was for God to love the world, love the hell out of them. Now the expression of that love, Luke chapter 14, it's all over the Gospels. This is the one that I felt led to share with us this morning. And I'm going to share three more as we get up to the holiday season of Easter. Luke chapter 14, verse 1 through 6. I'm just going to read it to you. And I'm going to read it to you today, actually, in the New King James translation, because I really like the way it reads there. Some of yours may read different. If it reads different, then just pay attention to what's going on up here on the screen. And, or you can read it in your Bible and go, yeah, it's different. Either way. For, verse number 1, chapter 14, Luke, the Gospel of Luke. Now it happened, as he went to the house of one of the rulers, the Pharisees, to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. And behold, we just don't use that word very often too anymore. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsies. That didn't mean he dropped his drink, didn't mean he dropped his food. It was a disease where their joints would swell up and they, they, they would collect fluid and, and it would actually could turn into a kidney disease. And it was it was it, it was just wasn't good. And you can still get dropsies, I guess. But this man had dropsy. And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal?
deal on the Sabbath. So you got, you see what's going on here. You got Jesus hanging out with a bunch of religious leaders. That's what a Pharisee is, okay? Religious leader. Some, I'm not saying religious leaders are good or bad. I'm not trying to lump anybody anywhere. But it was the Pharisees and, and the Sadducees that ended up convicting Jesus and crucifying and doing all that stuff. But he's with these leaders and obviously there's lawyers there too because he answers to the, to the leaders and the lawyers. Is it lawful to heal someone on the Sabbath? They see this guy. He wasn't invited to the dinner. This was a lawyer and religious leader dinner. Hello, everybody Everybody catching the feel? You got the vibe. You probably wouldn't have been invited either. Neither would I. How many know there's a lot of things going on we don't get the invite for? Don't feel bad. Okay, this guy didn't get the invite either. He just showed up. Behold, there he was right in front of Jesus. Oh, you know that's what they were thinking too. The lawyers were going, what's this dude in? First he's smacking the temple guard upside the head. Did you let him in? How'd he get in here? That's what happened. So here we go. Verse 4. But they kept silent. And he took him and healed him and let him go. Not a whole lot said about the guy that got healed, was there? Did Jesus heal him? Jesus healed him, didn't he? I said, move on along your way. Some of your versions probably say a little bit more about that. Matter of fact, if you read it in the message, it says, So he took the man and healed him and sent him on his way. Not a whole lot said about the guy. Even the message translation, which usually expounds quite a bit, didn't say much more than he healed him, sent him on his way. Then he answered them, saying, Which of you, having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit, will immediately pull him out of the pit, even on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. You know why? Because they knew the conviction of their heart was, heck yeah, I'm pulling my donkey up out of the pit. <laughs> but you know what they felt the law said? Can't do it. No, 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 no. You can't do nothing that includes work on the Sabbath day. What happened was, instead of getting the spirit of what God was trying to get in them, they began to follow the letter of the law and measure each other's spirituality by how tightly and how closely they follow the letter of the law. Is everybody tracking with me? That's what was happening here. Jesus, now you think, wouldn't you think that the guy getting healed would be the, the headline of this or the main deal? He barely gets a sentence. Jesus saw him, walked over to him, healed him, said, get on your way. I got business to take care of here. We got problems. That's what he was saying. Isn't that what happened? He's like, you're healed, that's cool, we'll catch up with you later, we'll see you in the courtyard. I know you're going to be hanging out when I'm preaching later. Jesus knew he'd run into him, but it wasn't no big deal. You're going to get healed, you're healed, you're going to go celebrate. Woo! Told all his friends, all the other, because he didn't want to celebrate with those guys anyways. Why didn't he want to celebrate with those guys? Didn't know any of them. He ran to his own neighborhood and celebrated, didn't he? Isn't that what's supposed to happen when you get Jesus in your life? Yeah, we should celebrate together here at church. But let's be honest. You got a whole group of folks that you ought to be celebrating with about what God's doing in your life. That's just a side tangent, and we're going to go somewhere else. So, the title of my message is Love the Hell Out of Them. Point number one is now. Now is the time to love the hell out of them. This whole thing starts out, if you read in the New King James translation, it says, Now it happened. Folks, sometimes we think when I grow up in my faith, I'll start telling people about Jesus. Sometimes we think when I get a little bit smarter about the Bible and I can answer all the Bible questions, I'll start telling more people. You know what? I got stumped yesterday at lunch in Anaheim by a 15-year-old on a Bible question. Uh, you know what my response was? Same thing yours should be. You know what? I'm going to have to go back and read the Bible on that and see exactly what it says. How many think that's a good response? How many think that's a better response than Pastor Jeff trying to give some rabbit trail and talk him around in circles because I probably could have. He's a 15-year-old. Maybe not, though. Sometimes 15-year-olds can talk you around circles. And he is a very smart kid. It was Chris. It was Jose's boy. And uh, Fonzo's boy. Jose's boy. Fonzo's boy. And um, what we don't want to do 
is wait until you have all the Bible knowledge that you think that you could ever collect before you start telling people about Jesus. You need to start telling people about Jesus right now. Now is when it happens. I'm let me just say this. Don't count on tomorrow. No, none of us are promised tomorrow. You're looking at a preacher that realizes that all the more than I ever did. These last 16 months, I know there's no tomorrow promise. You got right now, you got today, and if there's someone in your life that you've been thinking you ought to share the love of Jesus with, you ought to go find them after church if they're not here today, and you ought to love the hell out of them. You ought to buy a lunch, dinner, take them to Starbucks. You ought to go home and clean, clean their house. I'm just saying, you need to be that expression of love to them in whatever way that God would have you to do that to them. Because you're the expression that God plans to use, and He wants to do it now. He's not waiting till we get saved enough. If you got saved, you are saved enough. If you've got a relationship with Jesus, you are saved enough. All it takes to get to heaven is say, God, I surrender let me say this, I know that, 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 that there's a lot entailed in that. I've been preaching the gospel for 25 years, and when I said I surrendered my life to you over 28 years ago almost, I'm still every day having to make sure that that surrender is still in place. How many understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do. But yours, if you've surrendered your life to Christ, if you've asked him into your life as your Lord and Savior, you are saved enough to tell people about Jesus. And now is the time it happens. Let me just tell you this. I told you that whole list of things we got going on. We're in the season. God's been pouring out his rain at Big House. Thursday night, we had a rain of the Holy Spirit in this place. Well, the Sunday morning last week, it was so powerful. Didn't even call people forward. It was powerful right there where people stood in their seats. The week before that, we had an outpouring financially and people were, people were, were blessed to be a blessing and to give. It was phenomenal. And we're in a season right now. This is our season. Let me just say this. Coming up to this season that we're coming up on, a year ago, I was in pretty rough shape, to be honest with you. I was in pretty rough shape. Matter of fact, when we get through Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, Easter Sunday was the last Sunday I preached to you guys for three months. I took three months off. Some of you came as new visitors during that time. Some of you never even knew that other guy that was struggling and that was, that was, that was barely making it through. Although God was still using the messages. Don't get me wrong. God's word is God's word. It's quick and powerful. Thank God for that. No matter how weak the vessel, God is strong. Matter of fact, he uses us in our weaknesses. But we're coming up on that one year. And you know what? We're in a place right now. And, and, and I've always believed Joel chapter 2 says that God will restore the years of the locusts. And whatever the enemy came to destroy, God will restore. And if we lost any momentum, any traction, if we didn't get to get, get as many souls into the kingdom in this last 12 months or 16 months, then we maybe could have, should have, because the locusts came and, and devoured some of our harvest of souls. I believe God's going to come back if we'll all dig in, go deep, allow God to take us deep. God will restore those years that the locusts tried to, 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 to rob from us. And we're going to see an outpouring of souls and the Holy Spirit in these next couple months like we never even imagined was possible. First of the year, I started telling you I was praying for rain. I'm praying for rain right now. And, and, and you say, well, it, it's happening, Pastor. I know. My pastor taught me to pray for rain when? When it's raining. Don't wait till you're in a drought to pray for rain. How many think that sucks? Has anybody been in a drought before? In your own personal finances, you've been in a drought before. In your own in relationships with people, it seemed like you couldn't get right anything with nobody. You've been in a drought. You couldn't get your job situation to line up right. You've been in a drought. Don't wait till you're in the drought to pray for rain. Start praying for rain right now. And then as it's raining, keep getting seeds in the ground, spiritually, financially, emotionally. Keep sowing into people's lives. Keep sowing into the community so that we're loving the hell out of it. We're, we're going to see an incredible harvest come. That's what's going to happen. Now is the time, number one. Number two, as you go. See, people go, well, how do you, how do, you do it, PJ? How do you tell people about Jesus? You know what? The cool thing is, you don't have to make it that big a deal. It shouldn't be that big a deal.
deal. It should be an as-you-go kind of deal. And that's exactly what happened here in this story was, now it happened as he, he who, Jesus, now it happened as he went. As he went to the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees. That's when it happened. And when does it happen for you? As you're going about your daily business. As people are watching you be who you are on a daily basis. How do you witness to people? How do you show the love to your community? How do you show the love of God? How do we love the hell out of our community? As we walk through our community. Amen? Amen. As you become a light in the darkness. As you allow God's love to flow through you. As you go out Saturday serving in the hood. As, they, as he went. And as you go. It's, 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 yes, we can love the hell of our community by bringing them to Big House. And I believe that can be part of it. How many understand what I'm saying? Because we can help them to grow. We can, if, if, you're, if you're not great at bringing them right to where they, they, they allow him to be their Lord and Savior, you can love them enough that they'll listen to you, that they'll go, yeah, I want some of this that you're talking about. Well, come on to Big House. You may not be great at grabbing people's hands and praying and saying, pray with me right now and accept Jesus into your life. Maybe you are that person, though, and that's cool, too. And everybody can be. I'm not saying you can't be. Everybody can be. But until you get to that place, you do it as you go. And then as you bring them, their lives will be changed because we believe change lives, change lives. Amen. So number one, now's the time. And we really are. I believe, family, we're in a place and a time right now. Well, obviously, we're in a place and a time we'll never be able to revisit, right? We're not coming back here. So enjoy it while you're here. But don't be selfish with the experience. And let's include other people in the experience. Amen? Amen? Number two, as you go. As you go to your job. As you go home and be with your families. As, as, as you come out to serve it in the hood. Bike week's coming up if you ride. As you're out in the different motorcycle events. How many hear what I'm saying? As you're doing what you love to do. Be a light in the, in the darkness. And love the hell out of the community that God placed you in. Right? Number one, it's now. Number two, it's as you go. Number three, I love this point. It just keeps popping up. So you know what I keep doing? I just keep preaching it. I love breaking bread. Anybody figure that out yet? If you've been here three or four times, you've heard me invite people out for lunch, right? Anybody ever heard me invite people out for lunch? Anybody not got an invite from me for lunch yet? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you've not been invited by Pastor Jeff to lunch. You're invited right now. We're going to go to Minder Binders right after church. Everybody is invited. I love it. How cool would it be if we just went over and did a takeover at Minder Binders today, right? We never even been over there as a whole group. We're going to do it because it's easy. I got some things going on this afternoon. We don't have to drive nowhere. We're going to walk right next door. As soon as I'm done with the altar time, we're going to go over there and have lunch. So if I haven't invited, because I believe in breaking bread. Luke chapter 4, verse 1, 14, verse 1. It says, he went into the house of one of the rulers. Why was he going into this house of this religious leader that most of us would have probably not been invited to? Why was he going? He was going in to eat bread. Yeah. I'm telling you, there's something special. People will break bread with you that won't come to church with you. Right? And, and I believe breaking bread is just finding common ground. And why is breaking bread the most simple common ground? Everybody breaks bread. Everybody eats. We all got to eat, right? Not everybody, almost everybody, but not everybody drinks coffee. Are you hearing what I'm saying? No. Well, most of us do. No, hey, hey, hey. Pull it down, little girl. Step on my coffee preaching. <laughs> but everybody breaks bread, right? Everybody breaks bread. And so, breaking bread is important. It's a way of you building relationships with people enough to get them to church. It's a way of building relationships with each other enough that we can be transparent, vulnerable, authentic with each other, that we can help to see each other to a next level. How many hear what I'm saying? You build relationships breaking bread. I'm a big fan of it. I also like eating. You do, huh? It's better than the alternative of not eating, right? <laughs> but so often, I mean, we find these stories where there's some commonality that is around breaking bread and spiritual things happen around that physical thing that's happening. And I believe if we'll allow the Lord 
and we'll, we'll, we'll get out there and enjoy that, that season of breaking bread with folks, God can do some incredible, incredible things. Now, I know I've preached about breaking bread, I think once a week, the last month almost. I, it might have been one of my points last week. I can't remember. It wasn't last week. It was at least, I can tell you. I can look at my, I'm not going to look at review. Number one, now's the time to love the hell out of our community. Number two, or that's number one, now's the time. Number two, as you go through your daily life, love the hell out of our community. Number three, while you're breaking bread, you can love the hell out of our community. Hey, listen, me and Bailey, Jeffrey's girlfriend, she's not old, so I won't call her old girlfriend, she's still young. Jeffrey's in heaven, she's here, They're really, she's got another boyfriend, but I don't even know what else to call her. So, But anyways, me and her, were, we went out to eat after Thursday night Bible study, just went next door. And the waitress was like, oh, pastor, I'm so sorry. I told you guys I was going to come over there and I haven't made it. How cool is that? I totally forgot she said she was coming. Or she might have told someone else that was eating with us. I don't know. But enough relationship had happened by us breaking bread there that she wanted to be at church and felt, oh, I forgot to go. Breaking bread is an opportunity for us to love the hell out of our community. Amen? Amen. Number four. About to wrap it up here. He was closely watched. Hey, listen, while you're trying to love the hell out of your community, especially once you start talking about Jesus, you're going to have all eyes on you. Right? Sometimes because they're one of your disciples and they're watching the way you live because they're trying to emulate your faith. Sometimes because they're one of your critics and they're trying to poke holes in your faith. Are you hearing me? Watch this. Watch this. Luke chapter... Oh, can you believe I haven't even left the first verse yet? If that says 17, that's the wrong. It's, it's really one. Uh, I, I've noticed another type. I do typos all the time. Now I notice when I put a typo here, I better tell you guys that because it's going to show up. How many know your sins will show up in places you didn't expect them to? <laughs> that was just a free tangent there. Be sure the Bible says your sins will find you out. Luke chapter 4, verse 1, 14, verse 1. He went to the house of one of the religious leaders of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath. That was Sunday, so that even gives us more qualification that we should go to Minder Binders today for bread breaking. That they watched him Closely, I like what it says over the, in the, if you read it from the message, it says, all the guests had their eyes on him, watching his every move. And folks, you may not like it. Some of you all, I, I read some of times I see folks post stuff on Facebook, don't judge me. Folks, 
Don't get upset when folks watch you closely. Live your life in such a way that people should be able to watch you closely. Amen. And you know what? Truth of the matter is, if come on now, come on now. If we put this book first place in our life, and if we allow our lives to line up with this book, they go on ahead and watch you closely. You know what's also going to happen? You're going to screw up. Because we're not perfect. Is anybody perfect in here? I didn't think we were. We're going to mess up. And they're going to watch you closely when you mess up. And what, what's the best thing to do when you mess up? Fess up. Well, you mess up, quickest and bestest thing you can do is fess up. You just tell everybody, you know what, I really did blow it. I blow it sometimes. And when you mess up, fess up. Tell people, you know what. Or, and maybe you've been messing up for a long time and didn't even realize it. Anybody ever done that before? Maybe you've been messing up a lot. Then you're reading the word because PJ's always telling you read the word and says things like, well, if you don't know what to read, at least take the scriptures I preached and read the chapters that I preached from. That would be John chapter 3 today and Luke chapter 4, okay? So if you're looking for some reading assignments there this week, there's two chapters for you. And as you're reading the word, what will happen? All of a sudden you'll find things like, oh my goodness. I didn't know it said that. I didn't, wow, I never read that that way. My bro Ted preached this, this Thursday. He brought something out of the story of Samson that I had never seen before, Ted. I'd never seen that point that Samson had led for 20 years. Samson had a big woman problem. Not, not, not the whip. I'm going to have a drink of water here. Let's just hit the reset button. Let's try that again. <laughs> Samson had a big problem with women. Maybe that's a better way to say that. I don't know the size of the women. He just had a big problem with them, okay? And he had a habit of chasing ungodly women. Caused a lot of mess. Caused a lot of strife, trouble for his family. Ted preached this Thursday. You could have heard all this if you've been here. But then after this trouble that he had at first, he said that he led it. For 20 years. You lead for 20 years, you must have led well. Generally, people won't follow you for 20 years if you don't lead well. How many hear what I'm saying? How many, how many know a 20 year strand is a good number of years to put together? One of the brothers here just came up to me before service, showed me his one year chip. I'm so proud of him. Give him a great big hand. I'll, I won't go with that in a minute, but I'm very proud of him. It's, it's a thing to celebrate, right? But when you put 20 of them together, leading, are you, are you tracking them? That was a big deal. And I never saw that before. I preached that. I preached on Samson. I don't know how many times before in 25 years I've been preaching. I never caught that point. But people are watching. And even after 20 years of great success that Samson had, people were watching. And when he fell, he fell. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And I'm here to say, every one of us need to live a life that lines up with this word, not with what your head says, not even what your heart says. You know, they're both made of flesh, and your flesh will get you in trouble. Now, God uses both of them to communicate to us, and we have to make sure that what we feel in our heart lines up with the word. Are you, are you tracking with me? Because sometimes you may feel something in your heart that's really good, but if it don't line up with God's word, you got to go, you know what? I'm going to reject that. And it may be hard to do. It may be a tradition or something you grew up with. I don't know. But God's word is really important. And we got to line up to it because people are watching. And they're watching you closely. Sometimes there are people in the faith. And let me say this. If you're in the faith, and you've been serving Jesus, whether it's one day, one year, or 20 years, you should have people in the faith following and watching your faith, that you're leading and discipling. I'm not the only discipler here at Big House. If that ever, if that ever comes to be the way, we'll cease to exist because the discipleship was meant to be done by everybody. And you know what? When you got disciples following you and watching your life closely, it keeps you accountable to living towards this word. Amen? Amen. 
And know this, when the world looks at you, it's okay. When they, when they look at you closely, it's okay. Don't pull that, don't judge me. How about live a life where you can say, hey, why don't you take an inventory of my life every day for me? Find your, find your strictest critic of your life and say, you know what, I'm, I'm in a project to try and better my life in 2016. I'm trying to live my life as close to God's word as I possibly can. Can I get you to do me a favor? You see me living my life outside of the bounds that you feel would be in God's word. Would you bring me scripture and talk to me about it? Even if they're not Christians. And they'd probably be glad to do that for you. I mean, how many ever met someone that could preach you the Bible better than you could preach the Bible? But they weren't serving God. You know, anybody ever met that, that barroom preacher? Man, you get up, you belly up to the bar, man, and they start telling you scriptures. Well, maybe it doesn't happen to you guys. It happens to me, not because I'm in there drinking, but we used to have church in a bar. And they start telling me scriptures. Sometimes I'm like, wow, man, this guy quotes scripture like the son of God. He's as ungodly as can be. Allow them to take a close look at your life. Know that they will take a close look at your life. Quit worrying about them taking a close look at your life. Ask them to take a close look at your life. Instead of telling them to quit looking at your life. Hey, and especially, I send these, these ridiculous things on Facebook, like nobody's allowed to repost my post. Hey, listen, you put it out there on the World Wide Web. That's the ding thing I've ever heard. If nothing you put out there is private. It's all public. That's why you put it out there. And there's some things you put out there. Don't say that to the World Wide Web. Just say it. It has nothing to do with close things. Maybe it does. They're watching you. That's what I'm saying. So number one, now's the time. Number two, as you go. Number three, breaking bread. And I love doing that. We're going to do it right after church next door. Number four, you're closely watched. Number five, behold. We just don't use that word anymore, so I just had to use it as a point. Seriously. You allow people to look at your life that way. You allow your life to be an example to people. You make your life all about loving the hell out of people. You know what's going to happen? All of a sudden, you're going to wake up one day and you go, whoa. That's, what, that, that's the modern day translation of behold, isn't it? Whoa. That's what they're saying. Behold. <laughs> hey, you know you're preaching good when the little babies are amen in you, right? Amen. Same Jesus that the alcoholic needs. 
Same Jesus that the addict needs. Same Jesus that the person that can't put two cents together to pay their bills needs. Same person that, that, that lost a child in an accident needs. Same Jesus. They all need Jesus. Good circumstances or bad circumstances, they all need Jesus. And they needed to see the power of God work before them. He healed that guy, and behold, he had an opportunity. Watch this. Verse 3. We read this thing in the King James. I'm going to just reread this whole scripture to you real quick. It says, now it happened. Because I haven't preached but two scriptures, and I'm getting ready to go to number three. Now it happened. As he went to the house, at the rulers and the Pharisees, with the rulers and Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. And behold, a certain man before him had dropsy. Verse 3. And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Wait a minute. I read that whole thing. Yeah. What was the question they asked? Anybody see the question in there? <laughs> Why, did, why was Jesus answering? Nothing was asked. Doesn't that get anybody's curiosity up? This is, this is the deal. Jesus knows it. they were asking themselves in their mind, what's he going to do? What's he gonna, we've seen this play out before. He usually heals folks. What's he going to do? So Jesus answered them. And you know what? I believe Jesus wants to answer you. Even though you didn't tell me what he wants, what you need, then tell me what your question is. Jesus wants to answer. He's waiting to answer. He answered these guys without the question being verbally asked. Because he is the answer. I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care what hasn't gone on in your life. I don't care how good it's been. I don't care how bad it's been. He's here today because he is the answer and he wants to answer and he's ready to answer.